More and more consumers want to buy products that align with their values, but choosing a side between Israel and Palestine is fraught, to say the least. How are the world's biggest companies responding to the war in Gaza? Hello and welcome to Roundtable. I'm Enda Brady. Now, global brands have a history of weighing in on political movements. Some say it's to sell products, while others suggest it's about corporate conscience. Is the Israel-Palestine conflict a step too far? Not long after the tanks rolled into Ukraine, companies left Russia. The list is long. Fast food, retailers, automakers, food, beverage companies and tech giants. In the days after the Hamas attack, hundreds of multinational brands condemned the group's actions and came out in support of Israel. Since then, they've mostly stayed quiet. A now-deleted tweet by a union of Starbucks employees expressing solidarity with Palestine resulted in both a lawsuit by Starbucks itself and a call to boycott the company. Divisions run deep and choosing a side can be costly. In July 2021, Ben & Jerry said it would stop selling its ice cream in the occupied Palestinian territories because it was inconsistent with our values. Israeli politicians accused the company of anti-Semitism and there was a boycott in Israel. I told my wife I forbid any Ben & Jerry's in our house at any time and for any reason. In the end, the Israeli part of the company was sold to a local business owner. Ultimately, this shows the level of polarization. Political leaders get involved, shoppers boycott products, stores are vandalized. If it's true that money talks, what exactly is it saying? Well, let's meet our guests. In Palestine is Omar Barghouti. He's the co-founder of the Palestinian Boycott, Divestment, Sanction Movement, BDS. In London, Safana Manajad, a marketing strategist and copywriter. Audrey Kemp joins us. She's reporter at The Drum, that's a marketing magazine, and she joins us from Los Angeles. And here with me in the studio is Professor Kamel Hawash, chair of the Palestinian Solidarity Campaign. His involvement with the BDS movement has seen him previously banned by Israel. Omar, I want to come to you first. A lot of people will have heard the phrase BDS, they now know what those letters stand for. Just talk us through the concept, how it works, and how successful you have been. Uh, thank you for this. Uh, BDS, Boycott Divestment Sanctions, was established in 2005 by the absolute majority in Palestinian society within historic Palestine, as well as in exile. It is inspired by the South African anti-apartheid movement, the US civil rights movement, as well as other movements for liberation. Basically, it calls for cutting state, corporate, and institutional complicity in Israel's 75-year-old now regime of settler colonialism and apartheid so that Palestinians can enjoy our basic rights under international law. Specifically, it calls for ending occupation, ending the system of apartheid, the system of racial domination and segregation, and the rights of return for Palestinian refugees. To achieve those, we've got to end world complicity in this system, as in the South African case. And it's not just states, it's not just Western states, it's also corporations and institutions. So basically, BDS works at various levels, from the grassroots to the policy level. In a nutshell, our theory of change is that in order to affect policy change, we've got to build enough people power, grassroots power, to make that change possible. Omar, how much support have you seen for your movement in recent weeks because of the bombardment of Gaza? Even before the recent uh, uh, Israeli aggression, which amounts to genocide, as international law experts tell us, um, BDS has been growing steadily between trade unions, farmers' unions, women's movements, climate justice, and so on. We have the support of networks that together have tens of millions of members worldwide. Uh, we've seen BDS affect decisions by sovereign funds in Norway, New Zealand, Netherlands, uh, some major church funds in the US and elsewhere to divest from banks and corporations involved in the occupation. We, since the latest 
an ongoing unfolding genocide that started October 7th, we've seen this support mushroom. Basically, because many people around the world are wondering beyond the demonstrations, beyond the amazing expressions of support and solidarity, what can we do in an effective, meaningful way that can actually support Palestinian liberation, that can support Palestinians to achieve freedom, justice and equality. And BDS gives a set of the most effective strategic tools that everyone can use in their workplace, in their union, in their school, whatever the case may be. Audrey, when the war started in Ukraine, Western companies were falling over themselves to support Ukraine, getting out of Russia, getting out of Moscow. I haven't noticed too many companies flying Palestinian colors in recent months. Yes, first off, thank you, Enda and TRT, for having me on. Um, yes, yeah, so contrastingly, we have noticed quite the silence from brands, and I think there are a number of reasons for this silence. Um, so consumers might have the same expectations of brands to be as outspoken about the Israel-Palestine issue as they have been in the past about other social movements from reproductive rights to Black Lives Matter. I feel as though brands are grappling with how to navigate um, such divisive waters. Safana, so do you think in boardrooms, in big companies, this is a talking point? that on a human level, on a moral level, business leaders want to be seen to support Palestine, and yet they know as soon as they do that, they will be hounded, accused of being anti-Semitic. Layered question, because so much of that is undoubtedly by design. So generally, I, what we are seeing, in my opinion, is something that has been mass manufactured. And I say this because when there is something that happens in the geopolitical sphere, there is usually a narrative that or a template that most people tend to follow and understand. But this one's quite specific in that it's by, my, by design and my understanding analysis of the language around it, it's subjecting people into a lot of silence. And we're just seeing the boardroom manufacturer of that, if that makes sense. So the rendition that is seen in the boardroom is that maybe actually this is where we continue to be silent. Uh, but again, my understanding of that when looking at the language that surrounds it, when looking at the fact that we we keep getting told that it's complex and when anyone looks into it, it's not, uh, we keep getting told that we could say the wrong thing when actually it's never been wrong to say that it's a war crime. We could be seen to be being divisive, but actually, it's not divisive to say people should be free and have human rights. Um, so it's 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 kind of giving it all it's got uh, to keep us subdued. And I think one the boardroom is just one of the places that happens to be that. But pretty soon, I think we will see, or we will have to see an overwhelming amount of demand from consumers who I believe have the right to do it because they've seen a pattern of them standing up. But an overwhelming amount of consumers just saying it's, it's time for you to speak up and then they're going to have to contend with what is morally correct to do and what is what is profitable really kamal the silence here from big business is deafening isn't it it is deafening i think one of the issues when compared with the ukraine is the ukrainian flag was not associated with any campaign to try and uh, link it to terrorism or extremism or whatever. But Israel has been working for years and its lobbies around the world to demonize the Palestinian people, but also the Palestinian flag. So when we talk about colors, as in the colors of the Palestinian flag, uh, uh, you know, when, when Ukraine happened, you, you couldn't walk down any street in London without seeing a Ukrainian flag. But when the Palestinian flag is raised, let's say in a school by, by, by a, a pupil, uh, they, they are told that that may have different connotations to something like the, the occupied people of the Ukraine, the occupied people of Palestine should be treated in exactly the same way. But unfortunately, there is that push to, uh, to do that, which means that uh, companies are feel, I think, uh, silent, even organizations. But when we have a march of a million people in the streets of London full of Palestinian flags, I think that should give them the confidence to say, actually, let us stand with the people who are being oppressed rather than fly the flag. And, and this morning, Wembley decided, or the F Football Association, that they wouldn't fly any flag. No more colours. No more colours, which is interesting because 
what would they be doing now if they had flown the, the, the Israeli flag? Surely they would have to fly the Palestinian flag, but now they've decided let's push politics onto one side. Whereas actually in, in football, there's a lot of politics. Watch Celtic with their Palestinian flags flying uh, every so week. On every week uh, and other clubs, but particularly in Celtic. So I think that there's the self-censorship, which is what the, 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 the pro-Israel lobby has been working on for years, that people say, don't go there, let's just not do that. But actually, if they're gonna stand and have any values and every company will tell you what their values are, then surely they must be standing with the Palestinian people at the moment. And the way to demonstrate that is by uh, uh, you know, having the colors of the, the Palestinian flag, but certainly not the flag of apartheid, which is the flag of Israel. Tell me, just on the issue of BDS, how much annoyance do you feel the BDS movement is for the Israeli administration? Oh, it's a huge, huge nuisance because they created a whole ministry the Ministry of Strategic Affairs was created to, uh, uh, and, and had who is now the, the ambassador of Israel as, as its minister at the time, Gilad Erdan. Uh, and he's the one who pushed the BDS law that stopped me from going in a few years ago. But, but it, it, they claim it's insignificant. Well, if it's insignificant, why are you fighting it so much? Why are you pushing so many states in the US to pass BDS law? Why are they pushing the, the British government here to, buy a, uh, to, to pass a law which says that foreign policy should be the gift of the government, but by the way, you can never boycott Israel, exceptionally. How can that be a rational thing to do? And they've tried to pass, move it on in parliament even after the 7th of October uh, to sort of uh, try and show that Israelis are trying to do something for them. But actually, I think we're all watching on our TV sets the, 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 the sheer, the, the, the criminality of what Israel is doing to the Palestinian people, the shredded bodies of children. I mean, people have been, you know, we've seen that. You don't have to go and search for it on, uh, you can watch the Main Street channel and see Every that. day. And that, I think, has, uh, is beginning to move the population. There will be another demonstration on Saturday. We're expecting a very large number of people to attend that because people have had enough of, of the normalization of the killing of children, which is what Israel has done. Omar, how big of a conundrum do you feel this is for Western brands? They want everybody's money, they want custom, they want profits, and yet they're staying silent on the issue of Palestinian children and women being bombed? They're not just staying silent, actually, because many of those brands have franchises and branches in Israel that have stood uh, hand in hand with the Israeli military while it's committing an unfolding genocide. And that's why many of those brands are facing mass, spontaneous grassroots boycotts from Indonesia to even the United States across the Arab and Muslim majority world. And this is a huge market. Uh, uh, so they, some brands are looking into this. I know it's effective because we at the BDS movement, immediately after we said some of those campaigns against McDonald's, Burger King, Pizza Hut, and so on, we have not started those campaigns. We don't lead them, but they're grassroots campaign and we have nothing against them. We support them actually. From the moment we supported them, we started seeing all the financial media in the world contacting us and the Reuters and the Associated Press, suddenly everyone wanted to know why is the BDS movement endorsing such campaigns, uh, uh, McDonald's is, is suffering, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So we know it's having an impact. Many people w don't want to support a company whose branch is enabling genocide. It's as simple as, as that. It's, it's a basic moral, profound moral uh, uh, obligation, at least not to help those companies. Audrey, in the United States, just give us a picture of how much kind of media pickup and coverage BDS is getting there? So I would say that the, the media coverage has been a little bit spotty, which is why I, I decided to cover the movement um, because it is becoming essentially a mass movement around, around the world. Um, but I did, I did feel as though that the stories weren't quite being told, um, that tide is beginning to shift. Um, but I, I do think that um, in, the, in the case of Ukraine, um, we, can, we can kind of learn a couple of things in order to garner more support uh, for the Palestinian cause. So United24 is a fundraising platform established by Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky, 
which has essentially allowed 110 different countries to commit to helping Ukraine, as well as a whole host of celebrities, including Barbara Streisand, Star Wars actor Mark Hamill, and the band Imagine Dragons. And, you know, in recent weeks, we've seen certain celebrities come forward and use their voice in support of Palestine, including Susan Sarandon and Bella Hadid. So perhaps once there is a more established fundraising platform for Palestine in place, we can essentially rally more media support, more public support uh, for the cause. So Fana, how do you think companies should be responding right now to what they're seeing on their television screens every single day? First of all, I think they need to humanize themselves away from the word company and know that people know that companies are run by people. So that we're not, uh, we're, there's, that facade is long gone, like thanks to Twitter or X or whatever you want to call it. And all of these ways that we can interact with companies and brands beyond um, just a logo and a slogan. So first and foremost, I think they need to understand that we see them and we have a quite reasonable expectations as a supporter um, and someone who has given money to the brand and we know that's the way that they can exist. And then I think with that, what they must decipher if they understand that the morally correct thing to do is to stand on the right side of history is they must stand firm and know that they will be historically correct if they do that. I think I, th there's... I think it's one of those things that could look nuanced and difficult in the time and the meeting in the boardroom. But once we start doing that wonderful thing of decentering ourselves and becoming very aware of the fact that we have been frightened into silence as consumers, as people on boards, as people in companies, as people who walk the earth. Um, and again, specifically by design from this uh, genocide campaign that we're seeing. I think once they start realizing that, they will start to understand that necessarily the only correct thing to do is to stand on the right side of history and make their firm stance that that is what their brand is doing. Kamal, I read the other day that a very popular Western brand of cola is struggling in many Middle Eastern countries. And in Egypt, a local brand called Spiros Spathis, which had been struggling, its sales are now skyrocketing. This is a soft drinks brand. Sales are up 300%. So if a company gets this right, they can make an awful lot of money, can't they? I think they, I think they could. Some of them don't have the capacity to, to do it very quickly. Uh, I was in Jordan only three weeks ago, and, and you wouldn't see a can of cola, Coca-Cola, and I'll use the brand because that's, that's a, an important one. In fact, uh, where, where it was available, people were not buying it. They were trying to buy alternatives, but that is not present in every country. But I found even here in the UK, and I, I, I live in Birmingham, that uh, I went to a restaurant the other day and asked for a, for a cola. I didn't specify the, the type. And they said, we only have this brand, which is not one of the main American brands. But I think allied to that, it's important. What I saw in Jordan and I see in the, uh, the Middle East is people are boycotting some of these companies because they're also American. So there is this, this, this knowledge that America is not just complicit in what is happening. America is leading leading the war against the Palestinian people in, uh, in Gaza. Tell so me, they want that think, boycotted. Do you think business leaders are worried? Some, some are beginning to, to wonder. When, when you mention a, a big brand or you talk about a big brand, if that can be boycotted, then others, and particularly ones which have franchises, because they think that, uh, uh, you know, fr franchise, people look at it as the main company. They, they're not interested in whether it's, it's a franchise, but then the franchisee will be saying to them, for goodness sake, we've got to start changing, otherwise we would be boycotted, and I will close down. You might continue to, to, uh, to operate, but I won't, won't be able to continue. But there's a huge market out there, isn't there? Yeah. Hundreds of millions of people who want to be on the right side of history. Yes. And, and the point is, there are so many brands, and this is where uh, uh, the BDS has been very successful uh, down the years in trying to focus people's attention on certain brands rather than a scattergun approach. Because, of course, you and I can decide not to go into this shop, not to buy that brand, but it is when big brands fall, and I say fall, that that sends this, this, this shockwave uh, uh, across to the, to the others. I want to look at the issue of influencers. Social media influencers, celebrities, they're emerging as key players in the battle for hearts and minds here. Even as big brands shy away from direct association with the Palestinian cause, influencers are advocating for consumers and directly supporting people in Gaza. Huda Beauty, now this is a cosmetics brand. 
It was set up by the American Iraqi influencer Huda Katan. She's pledged one million US dollars to humanitarian organizations in Gaza. Asma Ramdani, she's an influencer in the Netherlands. She gives her followers practical advice on replacement brands. Have a listen to Asma Ramdani. Regarding my field as skin therapist and everything concerning the beauty, the best way to inform our followers is using the social media, the social network. We share the information with followers by using reels, stories and posts on Instagram. We give them all the information about all brands that they are supporting Israel, but we give them also the alternative. The alternative can be local brand or international brand. What I noticed as influencer that the million of people are doing their best to boycott all the brands that they are supporting Israel. Omar, how important in getting the message out are influencers? It's very important, as was mentioned, in Hollywood, for the first time ever, we're seeing many, many, many A-listers coming out saying free Palestine, uh, stop the war crimes in Gaza, we support Palestinians and so on. And the most important point, they're being very defiant. So one major star was dropped from Scream 7, but she said, you know what? I don't care, free Palestine. That type of defiance we have never seen to this level spread even in the ivory tower of, of Hollywood. Why is this important? Because many of those mega stars have tens of millions of followers. So when the mainstream media blocks us, blacks out any news about BDS, as was mentioned, uh, we don't get interviewed by the New York Times and the CNNs and the BBCs of the world. They've cut back a lot of those interviews. We used to get interviewed quite a lot, but not in the last few years. So how do we get around that blackout, basically, through social media, but most importantly, through influencers, through those stars? They educate their base, and in turn, their base starts turning to the BDS movement website and social media accounts, and they start learning, and they start seeing what CNN and BBC are not letting them see. They start seeing the nuance, and they start getting the facts and judge for themselves. And this is where the influencers and celebrities are playing a very, very important role. Just yesterday, it was announced that more than 4,000 musicians under the banner of Musicians for Palestine issued a statement calling for solidarity with Palestinians in, in facing the genocide in Gaza. Extremely important. And those are electronic musicians, not just the stars in Hollywood, but all kinds of musicians, writers, filmmakers are coming out very, very strongly, academics, student leaders, and so on. Audrey... How important do you think influencers are here in terms of shaping narratives? I think the influencers have a really formidable impact on their audience. Um, in the industry, there are even influencers that are called micro-influencers. These are influencers that have as low as in the thousands uh, of followers. And those influencers have a really, really high uh, level of engagement among their audience. So when influencers come out and support any cause, that's likely to have a really profound ripple effect. And brands understand this as well. Brands often call influencers the digital storefront, essentially. They are inextricably linked. Um, they are just as strong uh, a channel in advertising as, um, as you know, TV or radio or any other um, form of advertising. So yes, when we, when we see these influencers come out and show support for Palestine, that is bound to have a really lasting impact. Safana, you're nodding in agreement. Yeah, it's, um, it's one of those things where you see some influencers give in to the fear that I've been alluding to before, right? Of like, I don't have to speak up, I can stay neutral. And that again, they're susceptible to that messaging because it's what they've heard, it's what they want to believe, that this is one of those things that you can have two opinions on whether or not a war crime is an okay thing to do, whether it's definitively the wrong thing to do. Um, so it's one of those things where you... As a speaking as someone who has seen the insides of media, the seen the insides of marketing, I know that brands wouldn't have spent a penny on these influences if they didn't think they could have any effect on the ground, right? On on us, on our opinions, on what we spend our money on, on where our attention goes, and all of this stuff. So necessarily that means we're talking about people who have, by definition, influence 
on the way that the society goes. And again, it's just like those people in the boardroom. If they were to give in to the fear that they've been told is the right thing to do uh, and the fear that, okay, it's a complex issue, I shouldn't chime in, I don't want to look like a fool and all of this stuff, and potentially there could be sides to this genocide, um, and all of this messaging that they're being inundated with from mainstream media, where, as we've been told, like, they're hiding the some of the parts that fit them and they're showing the other parts that are okay. The, we're talking about, again, we can call them influencers, we call them people in the boardroom, but people en masse are being set, like subject to this messaging that the whole campaign is if you stay silent long enough, you're doing fine. But we know this is not true when it comes to a genocide. And we know for a fact that that's all it takes for a genocide to go ahead. So we can say that influencers have a, like, they have a responsibility to do this. We know that people in a boardroom have a responsibility to do this. It's just we're hoping and we are praying that they overcome that fear that's been embedded into them to stay silent, to stay neutral, to stay thinking that it's complex. It's thanks, their Safana. time to chime in. Yeah. Omar, Audrey, Safana and Kamal, thank you all so much. Remember, you can see more discussion and debate on our YouTube channel. Search for Roundtable TRT World. But for now, from me and the Brady and all of the team here, goodbye and thank you for watching.